position chair and make yourself comfortable and we'll get started. Before we do that, let's do a sound check. Uh, Liz, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Hello everyone and welcome to our ninth session in our Woodland Conferences webinar mini series of 2021-22. We've had a little break since Christmas and now we're back at it in February, the coldest month of the year. So welcome. My name is Don Cameron and I'm a regional forester with the Department of Natural Resources and Renewables, the old lands and forestry and DNR. It's our newest name. So it's my pleasure to be your MC again this evening to this event. In the spirit of meaningful reconciliation, we acknowledge our presence on the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people in what is known today as Nova Scotia, a small part of Mi'kmaq. The Treaty of Peace and Friendship of 1725 and subsequent treaties remain foundational to the relationship between the Mi'kmaq people and all Canadians. We are all treaty people. This conference mini-series is a variation of our annual Spring Woodland Conference Series, which we've been organizing for many years. Despite the pandemic, we are pleased to be able to continue to offer interesting and educational presentations this year on this on, in this online format. Hopefully, it will be safe again to meet in person for the 2022 Spring Conferences for which we have begun the planning process. In fact, We've been planning for several months to hold the Central Region Conference Saturday, April 2nd. We will host the event in Millbrook, just outside of Truro. It will include many interesting Indigenous related topics and speakers, including Gerald Glode, who was so well received in his last presentation with our conference several years ago. Now, as far as our setup this evening on WebEx, the platform we're using, all participants are automatically muted and your video is turned off for the benefit of the presentation. Your names are invisible to each other, but visible to us, the event organizers. There will be opportunity for you to ask questions. There's a Q&A panel on the upper right side of your screen where you can post your questions. You just click on the arrow beside Q&A and say to all, click on all presenters. And you'll be able to forward questions to us at any time. So you can work on that at any time during the presentation. At the end of the presentation, I'll read the questions out to the presenter to answer verbally. Depending on the number of questions, we may not get to all of them during the time allotted, but our goal is to send out answers after the session today to any questions that are not answered, but that hasn't been a problem to date. Please note that in case you would like to go back and review some part of this event, or if you know of someone who may be interested in the topic but not able to be with us today, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted online at nswoods, that's n-s-w-o-o-d-s dot c-a, for future viewing, free of charge. The previous webinar sessions were recorded and are now available online. And that includes presentations entitled Forest Sector and Forestry Transition Team Update, Private Land Stewardship, Invasive Species and Forest Pests, Climate Change and Forest Carbon, Biodiversity, Wildlife and Species at Risk, Forestry Business Planning and Potential, and Woodland Stewardship Planning, Pathways to Success. Now the link for any and all of these recorded sessions is also available at the nswoods.ca website. I should add that thus far, there have been many hundreds of viewings of these recorded sessions. So we're very pleased. There seems to be lots of interest. And for today's session, we have well over 200 individuals registered to participate from all over the place. Globally, that is. Uh, note, today's speaker bio and any speaker handouts are available through the nswoods.ca website as well. The format of our session tonight, uh, our presenter Brad will provide his presentation without interruptions, followed by time at the end for questions and answers. And the event today, we're planning to be finished around 8 p.m. We're happy to be able to offer this special COVID version of the Woodland Conference Series. For those of you who are regulars at our annual conferences, you may recall that we create agendas for each conference based on feedback we receive from you participants. So again, we ask you to please provide feedback to us at the end of today's session. At our last session in November, we had two random draws to select the winner from those that participated in last, in last month's webinar by Dave Sutherland, and a second lucky winner for those of you that completed our survey that we distributed to get your feedback and ideas for future sessions. So the lucky winners were Sean Scott, and he won a hand pruning saw, and Adrian 
Martin Q won an outdoor adventure prize pack. So congratulations to Sean and, Ad and Adrian. Okay, it's time to get the show started. So over the years in these conferences, it's been obvious that woodland owners of all levels of experience have been interested in learning more about flora and fauna, especially things that most of us don't know a lot about, such as lichens. Today, we're fortunate to have joining us a lichen expert, Brad Toms. Brad is a wildlife biologist at the Mersey Tobiatic Research Institute since 2009. Previous to that, he studied seabirds and other bird species at risk for the Canadian Wild Service in Mississauga, rattlesnakes for Parks Canada, and black bears for the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources. Brad's projects almost always focus on recovering species at risk in Nova Scotia through collaborative studies and stewardship. In Brad's spare time, he enjoys staring at the ocean, looking at pelagic seabirds, orienteering, and spending time at Shingle Lake. The title of Brad's presentation today is The Lichens in Your Woodlot, the wonder of one of the most overlooked organisms that surround us each time we set foot in the forest. Brad, on behalf of the webinar organizing committee and all those out there in the virtual world intently peering into their computer screens right now, welcome aboard. The mic is all yours. All right. Flip on my screen. Share. Screen one, share. Okay, and then I'll go like this. Just be a second, folks. Now, can somebody confirm to me that uh, it's being oh, okay. good? That's great. Okay. Excellent. And I'll move this little window out of the way. <clears throat> right on. Okay. So, um, uh, the, <laughs> the, I'll, I'll correct in the bio. Uh, I studied Massasauga rattlesnakes, not anything in Mississauga. Um, uh, nothing against Mississauga. Um, so, uh, I'm Brad Toms. I'm the wildlife biologist at the Mersey Tobiatic Research Institute. Uh, we are a nonprofit research institute based in uh, Kempt uh, along Highway 8 near Kedgey. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right into things. So what I want to do, my goals for this, uh, not to teach people how to identify lichens, that's a whole other skill, uh, a lot of work that you have to do, but I'd like to give you a broad overview of um, lichen diversity that's typical of a Nova Scotia woodlot, give you an understanding of the function of those lichens, what they do, uh, and how they benefit uh, for us in woodlots. So uh, why should you care about lichens? And I'm going to start off by kind of, you know, going a bit high level. Um, and, and most people, uh, they have a sense that, that we, scientists, biologists, whatever, know a fair bit about the natural world. That, that obviously people have been studying it for, you know, a, a few decades, uh, you know, a <laughs> hundred years, maybe a little more, uh, and we obviously should know a lot by now. Um, and, you know, our high school teachers might give us the impression, even college professors and university professors might give us the idea that we really know a fair bit, but the reality is uh, we don't. Uh, and lichens are very kind of exemplary of that, that, you know, Western science still has kind of a very feeble grasp on ecosystem function and, and especially really complex ecosystems how they work in and all the intricacies of, of the interactions between all the different taxa um, and then we also don't even have baseline data for a lot of things like lichens and mosses and fungi uh, so you know the, the there's a, a vast world still to be discovered and, and lichens are definitely part of that uh, there's an interesting paper recently in Nature looking at bias in uh, in data, in biological data from a giant kind of worldwide database and looking at different families, uh, groups of animals 
and looking at where we kind of have way more data than we actually have species and where we have way less data than we have species, kind of what you would expect we'd have versus what we really have. And you can see birds at the top, you know, kind of very out there in terms of we have way more data on birds than we actually have bird species in the world. And we have way little data on insects versus how many insect species we have in the world. And there's kind of a grade in between of, you know, things that are in positive things that are in deficits and as you can see lichens there are kind of on the deficit side um, so we definitely uh, even among things like birds where we have a lot of data and even though we still don't know a lot of things about bird distributions and behavior and interactions with other things lichens are even at an even more disadvantage than the species we do kind of know a lot more about uh, and the other point there is is you know a lot of the conservation work that's being done uh, around the world is in those areas where we have the excess of data and we're trying to save species and things like that and the place we're actually losing species is where we're not even aware of the fact that they're at risk and then they're going at risk we just know they exist we have them in a museum collection and the next time we go to look they're not there and then they're extinct uh, so that you know there's there's really big bias in in kind of uh, a lot of what we know and for any given topic you know we have to look at kind of where our abilities are and our confidence is and and the Dunning-Kruger effect and how it applies to us and you know we we don't know what we don't know up to this certain point right you know uh, we could very we get very confident in our abilities when we don't know much about it and the more you know about something your confidence goes way down uh, and, and lichens definitely for me have, have been one of those humbling things the more I've learned about them over years the more I'm kind of humbled and, and the same with a lot of other things you start to get into insects and you go oh geez you know this is really this is, there's a lot out there it's crazy uh, and then you know you don't kind of gain any more confidence until you kind of really increase your knowledge to become an expert in something so and I, I kind of I'm, I'm into lichens I work with lichens I definitely don't kind of consider myself a lichen expert uh, but I'm, I'm kind of somewhere on that curve uh, where I've, I've kind of come out of the the the, the, the bottom of it <laughs> um, so uh, why should we uh, learn about lichens and care about lichens uh, so we're still operating on a lack of fundamental uh, knowledge so it's they're, they're a good uh, opportunity to learn a lot more and they are a complex organism and they have complex interactions so they're actually a really good model for learning about complex ecosystems and interactions and, and kind of getting over our arrogance of our abilities to manage ecosystems and, and and say come back step back and say you know what maybe we don't know as much as we think we know in terms of of what we're doing right now and we're kind of flying a little blindly uh, as we as we do a lot of things um, so all this to say I want to give you an appreciation of the complexity of lichens that are in your woodlots and why they're both you know ecologically and economically kind of valuable to uh, to you so I'll, I'll say a, a broad thank you uh, to people on iNaturalist and, and other uh, wildlife biologists in Nova Scotia that I definitely take a lot of photos from because there's a lot of people with much better photos than than I have uh, so they're credited throughout and, and there's some pretty cool photos of these lichens throughout thanks to those people um, so the basics of a lichen we'll, we'll start there so lichens uh, as some you may know are, are made up of different organisms working together so they're they're like a coral they're a composite organism they're made up of uh, a species of fungi uh, which provides the kind of structure uh, and the, the other part of the organism is an algae or a cyanobacteria and they it lives within the fungi so the fungi makes up the structure and the photobiont is you know there's a lot of new terms when it comes to lichens lichens but photobiont is the, the partner that provides the the food through photosynthesis so the algae or cyanobacteria um, so they're 
they're already like you know their own little ecosystem in that they're they're things that are working together and it already have complexity in that they're two organisms within one um they draw the nutrients that they need from from uh the the like rainfall and the air and through photosynthesis so they don't draw from their hosts so you can find uh, lichens on all sorts of things you know if you live in nova scotia you find them on your house uh road signs uh, you know rocks and trees um these are just places for them to live and get stuff from the air and from rainfall they don't draw anything from their host surfaces um they can contribute to rock weathering uh, where they you know are are on those surfaces and you know you'll if you've ha ever had them on your shingles and you kind of wash them off it definitely you know you'll see that they take a little bit of rock with them when you blow them off with a power washer or something but uh, they're not actually taking nutrients from there it just happens to be that they're bound to it and when you knock them off they tear off a little bit with them and that's how they kind of contribute to rock weathering too um, or one of the ways but they're most for the most part they're they're not harmful to the surface of their host so when you see when you go in the woods and you see a fungus popping out you know mushrooms popping out of a, of a tree trunk you can go oh there that tree you know might be on its way out and that fungus is feeding off of the trunk of that tree it's not so with lichens so when you see all the abundant lichens in Nova Scotia you get in the woods and you see all these amazing lichens on the trees compared to if you've ever been in you know southern Ontario and and seen the much more bare trees due to past air pollution uh, and and you see how abundant they are here and you and a lot of people think oh you know they must be causing some damage to the tree you know they don't really so that's a good thing um <clears throat> so adding to the complexity of of them being you know this little multiple organisms in one they also reproduce through quite a variety of uh methods and and structures so Again, more new words, apothecia, isidia, cerealia, piscidnia, piscidnia, I never know how to say that one. Uh, and I should look it up. There is a pronunciation guide in the book I have. Um, they can grow from fragmentation. So some species, they can be broken off and blown in the wind and set down somewhere else and just and start growing again. Um, some species can grow like that, uh, spread like that. Uh, some of them are vegetative. They release spores that are ready to grow. So those spores fly through the wind or on a bird or whatever, get dropped somewhere else, and, and they can just start growing right away. And they can also uh, reproduce by spores that need to be germinated by another individual. And that's, you know, form of sexual reproduction. So, uh, and the, the structures and the ways they do it, there's it's quite a variety of different structures uh, that they have, uh, different methods uh, for dispersal. So some species have really uh, easy dispersal, uh, and some are definitely much more challenged in terms of meeting up with another uh, spore from or another part from another lichen and, and in the right place and on the right type of tree you know they can some of them are much more limited than others which is why some of them are, are kind of much more abundant than others um, so some lichens uh, have added complexity in that they depend on the life of something like a liverwort so if you've ever been in your woodlot and you see these kind of brown uh, stuff on your tree trunks it it's not dead it's actually alive uh it's a liverwort called fulania and and uh it has kind of a chemical in it that uh, makes it brown but it has uh, photosynthesis happening uh inside of it and um we know that boro felt like in uh meets up in the water sacks of the fulania liverwort and and has to have that there uh, as a part of its reproductive cycle um the more complexity blue felt lichen which uh, we have here but in a study in Spain was found that it needed a common species of Dendris to call on uh, to be near it to get the photobiont from it so they have like this interaction uh, where they're kind of dependent on each other even though they're totally different you know genuses and and they don't you know they're not really alike really in any way but they're dependent on each other um, so the connections we have between 
common and rare species, you know, as well as connections between mosses and liverworts. The all those for all the species we have are probably quite beyond, I think, what we can really imagine right now. We've kind of learned from some species, some of these novel things about the water sacs and, and needing photobionts from others. But, you know, this is that's really leading edge kind of science. Uh, and so all the interactions that, that happen among lichens is really probably, you know, in my lifetime, we're probably going to learn heck of a lot of, of new stuff and, and uh, uh, it'll probably be pretty neat. Um, but this is why for lichens habitat connectivity and, and forest continuity is, is very important for a lot of the kind of rarer species especially uh, because they, they're probably depending on some of these uh, interactions and perfect conditions kind of being available and, and enough host trees nearby to be able to spread to and have the chance of meeting up uh, all that kind of stuff, um, and this this you know the same notion of of the complexity is probably also true for invertebrates and fungi in the forest. We just don't know a lot of those interactions right now, and that's you know on the Dunning Kruger chart. It's the not knowing what we don't know. We're still at that point. Um, so some lichens uh, they're um, nitrogen fixers. So cyanolichens, which uh, are often but not always the darker uh, lichens that you see uh, have a cyanobacteria uh, cyanobacteria as the photosynthetic partner uh, and they're able to fix nitrogen from the air and uh, when they fall down off a tree or removed in any way and they return to the soil they can break down and uh, enrich the soil with nitrogen and that it is kind of a, a novel thing because in Nova Scotia, very few tree species are nitrogen fixers. So uh, it's really, you know, willows, poplars, and alders, um, and and a lot of the other trees aren't aren't nitrogen fixers. So the lichens are definitely playing a, a pretty crucial role in the ecosystem in terms of of grabbing that nitrogen out of the air, or especially cyanolichens grabbing that nitrogen out of the air and and you know making it into something and then having it there until the end of their life when they fall off and are down on the ground and, and contribute to the soil. So that's kind of a one of their big roles. Uh, they're also habitat for um, uh, for lots of other things. So one of the things when you you know start to do microscopy on on lichens uh, and you you take a little sample of of some home and you you put it under the microscope and you start looking around and you start seeing all these little invertebrates uh, and everything crawling around in them and, and sometimes you know bugs crawl out and you have to grab them with your tweezers and you know get them out because they they've just jumped out of the lichen you're looking at but they're little ecosystems unto themselves uh, you can just see in the picture there the kind of structural complexity that that lichen provides a uh, variety of places for insects to hide, for water to be captured that, you know, can then be gotten by insects and gastropods and, you know, any number of invertebrates. And uh, they're also a water or a nutrition source for lots of species. So you can kind of see white patches on some of these lichens and those have been grazed uh, by slugs. So we have both uh, native slugs that graze lichens as well as uh, invasive non-native slugs that have been grazing some of our rare lichens as well as common lichens. Um, so yeah, they're, they're quite a, a, a complex little ecosystem under themselves in that way as well. Uh, and so then there's, you know, think about those things. Well, they support invertebrates and what eats invertebrates? You know, birds and lots of other things like that. So it's all adding to that complexity of the, the forest ecosystem. Uh, having healthy communities of all the different taxa. Um, so lichens themselves, uh, they fulfill quite a few different um, niches. Uh, and, you know, they have, there's lichens, you know, this is just the same as once you start learning about insects, you learn, okay, there's there's the insects that likes this flower and this flower only, and then there's a lichen, and then there's an insect that parasitizes that insect that likes that flower, and then there's one that parasitizes the one that parasitizes that one. You know, you start learning about these things. Lichens also have lichens that are parasitic, lichens that live on other lichens. And in this picture, you can see uh, there's this Normandina pulchella uh, that grows on other lichens. 
There's lichens that grow underwater, lichens that grow only in calcium rich areas, lichens that grow in the salt spray zones. Um, you know, there's lots of different uh, niches they, they fulfill. And they can be, you know, uh, microscopic like that, that Normandina and even smaller than that, all the way up to, you know, the size of dinner plates. If you've ever been in the back country of Kedji and see smooth rock tripe, that's, you know, the size of your head kind of thing. Um, so the interesting thing about that is, is if you drop a lichenologist somewhere in, in Nova Scotia, they can pretty immediately tell you a lot about uh, the disturbance history of the forest, the moisture levels, air pollution levels, you know, underlying geology, all sorts of things, just based on the lichen community that they're able to observe <coughs> around them. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, much of the best lichen habitat in Nova Scotia is is areas with continuous forest cover. Um, so areas that, that might have, there's definitely areas that have had, you know, small scale woodlot forestry level stuff in, in the past um, and still have good healthy lichen communities, but in places with really high impacts uh, and places where the forest cover continuity has been disturbed, we definitely see total disruption in the lichen communities in those areas. Um, so the North American context, and this is where, you know, uh, if you, if you want to have an interest in lichens, uh, you're in the right place if you're in Nova Scotia, uh, especially if you want to be interested in cyanolichens. We have a really good diversity of macro lichens overall, about 350 species, but in terms of cyanolichens, uh, we're particularly uh, diverse, as you can see by that map, uh, among kind of the better places in Eastern North America, if not the best. Um, so as a result, we in Nova Scotia have uh, one of the longest running lichen conservation projects in Canada and maybe even North America. Uh, and we have quite a lot of dedicated lichenologists per capita kind of thing, uh, and quite a lot of other lichen enthusiasts. Um, and in the kind of uh, lichenologist for the, the National Museum in Ottawa, he, you know, he says he really likes coming and doing field work in Nova Scotia because of how many other lichenologists there are to kind of come out and, and talk to and, and do field work and get together kind of thing. Um, so from this point on, uh, that's kind of the basics of lichens are, are done. Uh, I'm going to go through what you're likely to find in your woodlot. So as an exercise in doing this, I went for a walk in my neighbor's woodlot. So it's, and, and it's, if you know who Blair Douglas was from NF Douglas Lumber in Caledonia, it's, it's basically is his old backyard um, right in downtown Caledonia beside an old farm field. And it transitions to a former pasture to a forested wetland. It's kind of a mixed Acadian forest with uh, all the typical kind of species you'd see, except red pine. I don't think there's any red pine in there, but most of the others. And so this is, should be like fairly typical of, of most Nova Scotia woodlots. So I just kind of went out for 15 minutes, grabbed pictures of, of species I could find. Um, and then, then I'll kind of just go through these and, and talk about these species. So this is uh, a Leptogium species. It's a jelly skin lichen. It's probably Leptogium cyanescens. I just took a quick picture and didn't really go into great detail in it, but it looked like Leptogium cyanescens. Um, you know, and this is this is one that can be found in kind of very uh, uh, exposed situations with a lot of sunlight. It can be on the side of the roads, on a tree, kind of more tolerant of air pollution. It's uh, even among the cyanolichens, it's kind of more tolerant early to mid succession establishment and on quite a lot of tree species and, and you know this is a nitrogen fixer as well so you, this is kind of a common one you see uh, in, in quite a lot of different conditions and uh, lungwort this is kind of a big showy one and in a lot of other provinces especially you know southern Ontario this would be you to find a tiny little one of this you'd be over the moon you know it was, used to be really exciting to find <laughs> Uh, tiny lungwort um, because air pollution kind of wiped them out in a lot of places. Um, but in Nova Scotia, we just have great abundances of this species. Uh, they're an indicator of good air quality. 
and it, despite the fact that they're green they're actually a nitrogen fixer as well um, so that's common longwort and there's also smooth longwort so this is one that's it's the same family although they've taxonomically kind of moved it uh, into a different family recently um, we're still calling them lungworts uh, so we have the three lungworts which is often where we start people with when we're kind of showing them macro lichens um, so this one's kind of grows closer to the tree uh, has these red discs on it uh, to distinguish it um, smoother surface again uh, in kind of both young and old forests and it's a nitrogen fixer and uh, grows on a variety of trees but you know quite often you find it on on red maple commonly um, this is the third species of, of lungwort uh, and this is the less common of the three species um, grows on a variety of, of species as well uh, but when it grows on fur it's only when it's in really good habitat really rich uh, habitat with a lot of moisture rainfall things like that um, so when we're looking for boreal felt lichen and we find uh, Loberia scrubiculata uh, on fur where we definitely it gets our uh, eyes going and going oh boy we could be in good habitat right now because that's that's good indicator um, and it's a nitrogen fixer and and more often in mature habitats but also can be in kind of rural uh, areas I have some on the side of the road in front of my house but really despite the fact that I'm in a town it's pretty rural uh, but a little less likely to see it in more of an urban area uh, and more often in older forests um this is one uh it's really it's always nice to find it's a nice looking uh lichen it's yellow spell yellow speckle belly um and uh, this one's been taxonomically kind of jumping all over the place recently but uh we'll go with pseudocephalaria holarctica and um it's kind of a more of an indicator of mid to mature forests uh, it's on a variety of species but this is again like the last one when we find it growing on balsam fir we know we're in a much richer kind of habitat because it doesn't grow on fir unless it's in really favorable condition and this is also a nitrogen fixer and this one can get pretty big and showy too um, you know this can it can be you could find little tiny ones quite often uh, but in in Nova Scotia you can find it growing really nice and big um, so continuing on my little journey look down and this is one that we quite often excuse me find towards the base of trees and uh, this is a cyano lichen uh, and it's called brown gray moss shingle lichen uh, a lot of the common names I don't like because they're <laughs> not really common they just from this book uh, that a lot of people accepted them because somebody put it in a book once um, but uh, it's you can see with this one where the the actual surface you can't see very much of it's mostly the reproductive bits the apothecia the red disc that you see and the actual surface of the lichen is mostly hidden underneath those um, and it's uh, you, you quite often see it plastered down at the bottom of of trees in in a lot of woodlots and uh, and usually in in more wet conditions at the base of trees you start to find a lichen like this so this was just at the edge of the treed wetland when I was kind of walking in the transition from the pasture to uh, the more mature forest and this is a nitrogen fixer as well um, this is kind of you know mid to mature forest brown eye shingle lichen Panaria rubiginosa uh, this can be kind of small from you know a few centimeters to uh, you know just covering entire trees um, quite often found on red maple um, has these you know I'm sure by now there's a bunch of people going geez isn't this just the last one he showed me isn't this the same one again uh, I swear they're all very distinct when, when you really start looking at them um, and it's also a nitrogen fixer um, so moving away from kind of the cyanolichens, that was kind of just a variety of cyanolichens I found while I was walking. Um, this is uh, old man's beard. Uh, so Usnia family, 
uh, you know, a lot of people kind of know this commonly as they see it out there. People call it old man's beard. Uh, it's really probably more like dozens of species. Um, there's a lot of uh, variety out there, but the really long stuff is pretty reliably uh, Usnia longissima. Um, but uh, it's kind of found, the long one is found much more abundant in undisturbed ecosystems, it was found in a paper a while ago. Um, and we know that uh, tricolored bats in Keji actually nest inside clumps of this lichen. It's only been seen in Keji. Uh, I think we're a little bit interested to see if we can find that happening outside of Keji as well, but it's been documented and redocumented uh, in Keji having colonies of tricolors in that lichen. Um, this is uh, similar looking, but it's, you know, kind of brown version of uh, old man's beard and it's a very different family, but they're called horsehair lichens and these are kind of wispy and, and thin and they're really easy to overlook. Uh, they're kind of often hanging from branches, not in really big clumps, in kind of more little groups. Uh, they're really easy to kind of look over uh, or look past, I guess. Um, but very common in Nova Scotia on a variety of habitats and species. And so this is starting to, these, these ones, the last one and this one, they grow on branches and up into the canopy. Uh, and this is, this next one, this is a macro lichen that does the same uh, varied rag lichen. And this grows on branches and you quite often, you know, especially if you're in a more mature forest and after a windstorm, you'll see branches on the ground with clumps of this lichen on them. It's a, it's a canopy lichen, it grows up high um, and quite often gets blown off during storms uh, and you'll see a big bunch of it on the ground. Um, and uh, it's very structurally kind of complex and it's, it's really good habitat for invertebrates up in the canopy. Um, so moving kind of down the tree from the uh, from the canopy, uh, often at the base of trees you find these lichens. These are called dog lichens. Um, and there's there's a fair variety of them, but they grow pretty big and they grow often right at the base of the tree. Um, and uh, when you're in areas that are really rich and kind of better moisture, more moisture, or whatever, better growing conditions, you'll see them start to grow up the tree trunk. Um, and I know for myself, I, I often get thrown off by that because I'll go, what the heck is that like? And then, oh yeah, I don't usually see it up this high. It's a, <laughs> it's a belt hitcher. Um, and uh, they have a distinctive saddle shaped apothecia and they're, they're nitrogen fixers. And they can also be found growing on, on rocks as well. Uh, and there's just another species of it kind of showing the uh, saddle-shaped apothecia that they have. Um, so, just looking at my time. Um, so this is a uh, mealy rim shingle like a like in Panaria conoplea. It's a relative of, of kind of one I showed earlier. Um, this one quite often will grow on these big mats on, on trees in, in good conditions uh, in, in older kind of more mature forest, uh, and is a nitrogen fixer as well. And so at this point in my lichen walk, uh, I was kind of running out of things that, uh, that were around and, and had to get back to the house and, and, uh, there was a few crust and dust lichens. And so we reached the point where I don't, I know what I don't know. I know that they're dust and crust lichens. I kind of know some of the families, but I am now here uh where i don't i don't know very much and i'm very not confident uh, uh and so we'll move on to the next section so the best i did for a rare species uh just walking in this woodlot in town was was an s4 an area rubiconosa this woodlot's never been clear cut uh there's been some light selection cutting and this is just kind of what i could find in 15 minutes so probably pretty representative uh, of, of most woodlots, although different parts of the province, there's things you wouldn't, wouldn't see the more Northern you get, you, some species aren't up there, even with common species. And there's some species that are common up in Cape Breton that we don't really have at all down here, you know, but this is kind of fairly typical. Um, 
So as I've said before, that you know the wide variety of lichens is kind of important to uh, all these different food chains and food webs and everything uh, that are happening in the forest. Um, but what happens if if you when you open up uh, the canopy too much for lichens, you get desiccation, you get uh, them drying out, uh, they get too much sun. Um, you, there's quite a lot of different re things happen and, and quite often you get big die-offs of, of lichens when um, you have a sudden change in, in, the, in the canopy. Um, so the kind of average operational of a, of a woodlot will have a lot of these ones that I've kind of you know shown uh, but they, they probably don't have some of the rare lichens that we have in Nova Scotia. Those quite often are growing, growing more in forested wetlands and peatlands and rivers, uh, river edges, um, which people often stay out of when they're kind of harvesting um, woods in their wood in their woodlot. Uh, but I have come across uh, places where you know people go in the winter when everything's frozen up and they go into forested wetlands and take some trees out. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I've kind of been in some of those areas and you could tell where they went in 40 or more years ago, took out a bunch of trees and you can really see, you know, the, the lichen diversity in that forested wetland versus the one that's kind of over there that they didn't go into pretty starkly different. It really uh, can impact them for quite a long time. And uh, it takes like the lichen community kind of a fair while to rebuild. So, um, on that note, kind of climax forests, uh, as we kind of like to refer to them, instead of old growth forests, uh, are forests that are, are kind of at their climax of succession, but they don't necessarily have old trees. So they aren't old growth. Um, so we have lots of climax ecosystems in Nova Scotia, like climax poplar forests, things people don't think of as, as climax forests, climax fir, red maple, sorry, red maple floodplains, uh, coastal black spruce. We have these ecosystems that are kind of at the peak of what they're going to be, uh, but they're not kind of old growth uh, in that kind of, in that they don't have old trees, but they're climax ecosystems. And so these are places that have been together, been intact for a long period of time. And this is quite often where we find our rare lichens in Nova Scotia. Um, so this is kind of the other day uh, I was out uh, doing a survey and this was just really stark spot where I had an old pit uh, where you can see in the picture on the left uh, the pit probably hasn't been operational for 40 years it stripped away the soil you know really not good soil there for the trees to grow in uh, they're they're pretty poor and you can see where the trees are pretty uh, bare and don't have any lichens and, and just 50 meters away from that pit uh, where the forest has been intact and continuous you know the trees have this more typical kind of coverage of a lot of different lichens and liverworts and mosses and and uh, all sorts of stuff over them very you know it was really kind of a nice stark illustration um, of that so uh, I'm at 7.3 oh boy so uh, I'll just give you a sense of, of uh, what we have for rare species in Nova Scotia quickly. Um, and then we're probably going to skip a fair bit ahead. Um, but so we have a uh, species at risk act that's federal and a provincial endangered species act. And, and uh, we have a body called COSIWIC, which uh, is a scientific body that, that decides um, the conservation status for species. Um, I guess I have a slide that's just kind of thrown in there. Uh, so <laughs> I'll just have to go off of my narrative for a second. Um, so I'll, I'll get to the listed species in a second. Um, so as an idea of kind of where effort has been in Nova Scotia for lichens, we actually keep track and we've been saving the GPS uh, search tracks of lichenologists for over a decade now and you can see those in in purple and you can see in the red areas where we have kind of big areas of the province that we haven't uh, searched and that's kind of for a variety of, of reasons 
Um, but uh, there's definitely, you know, this is again uh, part of the big knowledge gaps we have about distribution uh, of species uh, and, and kind of the deficits of knowledge that we're working in. Um, so boreal felt lichen is, is one of our lichens that have been listed for the longest time um, and uh, is uh, down to just a few sites at one point in Nova Scotia. All the ones from the, known from the 70s, 80s and 90s had all kind of died off. Uh, and then kind of conservation work really picked up uh, for it. Um, and uh, this is a species that exists in a very kind of narrow niche uh, in a band of coastal rainforests. And, and that's, that search data that, that was in that last slide, the map is very illustrative of where boreal felt lichen is and where we've been looking for boreal felt lichen. Uh, and where the habitat model is for that species. Um, so that's one of the reasons for that. Um, but I'm going to be, I guess I'm going to just have to skip a fair bit through <laughs> some of this, but uh, it exists in this kind of very specific forest type. Um, and there's been a lot of good work done to uh, increase protections for that over the years. Um, and so the population has kind of the amount that we've known has grown uh, to at a peak of, of 301 host trees. And, and we've kind of been seeing the decline of all those host trees we found over the last uh, six or seven years. Um, we're kind of down uh, to around 150 host trees at this point. And, and you know, we're doing a lot of investigating as to, to figuring out the causes and how to mitigate them uh, for that species. So the other um, listed species we have in Nova Scotia, there's a, a quick list of them. And, and a lot of them are kind of more recently uh, listed. And so as a result, a lot of the conservation work for them hasn't really ramped up the way, it, you know, Boro felt like and we've been doing work uh, in Voliers, uh, it's relative. We've been doing work on those for uh, a fairly long time. Uh, but a lot of these other species are just newly into the conservation world and newly able to get conservation dollars for them. And so we're just starting to get to the point where we're monitoring these species to figure out uh, what their survivorship is like and, and what are the threats on the landscape to them and and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I put this slide in because I quite often do this. So <laughs> I will be skipping ahead to slide 80 uh, because I'm choosing my own adventure. Sound effects even. So the current state of recovery uh, for species in Nova Scotia, um, as I said, we're just kind of identifying their conservation needs and the actions that we need to take. Um, so reactions to a presentation like this that I often get is, Brad, I see these species everywhere. Uh, and I bet you see some that are pretty similar and maybe sometimes you see some that are the rare ones. Uh, but there are a lot of very, uh, similar looking lichens. Uh, so it is fairly easy to confuse them and they're often not very identifiable with just a photo. It quite often you need to look at them in person, uh, or have a photo of a very specific part of it, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, so where to start with lichen ID is with anything, don't start with the hardest stuff. If you're learning birds, you wouldn't start with flycatchers. If you were learning plants, you wouldn't start with beak rushes. Uh, with lichens, don't start with har hard to identify, hard to find, rare or cryptic species. Start with the more common ones. Learn your liver warts, your, your, sorry, your lung warts. Learn your lung warts. Um, you know, your big showy species, uh, figure out what they are, identify them, but it takes a lot of time and work. So, uh, you got to kind of go out there and do it. Uh, but luckily if you're in Nova Scotia, if you're watching this and you're in Nova Scotia, you're in a good spot to learn because there's lots of them. They're big and easy to find. A lot of the common ones are, um, iNaturalist is a good place to get an ID nowadays. The algorithm is getting pretty good for a lot of species. Um, if you put a photo, a 
good clear photo up. Uh, it can quite often identify them to within the genus or even the species and, and there's lots of uh, enthusiasts and experts on iNaturalist there to confirm or, or say otherwise to, uh, to a identification. So photos, some species as I said are, are identifiable from a good in focus photo um, but many require uh, a photo of a specific part but some of them actually require a chemical test to really be sure um, or microscopy looking at spores things like that so but if you take any photos they should always be in situ without disturbing uh, the lichen in any way so that's my abbreviated version where I skipped over 30 slides or so uh, and I can take any questions Okay, folks, so this is your chance to ask Brad any question you'd like about lichens or related in that related field. Uh, so, you, again, you go to the top right corner, Q&A, and click on all panelists. Brad, while we're waiting for uh, questions, that was very interesting. Um, I mean, a lot of us don't know much about lichens, obviously, it, and, 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 you, and it was nice of you to admit that we as a science body, as, as a world, don't know much about it and there's lots there to learn. Um, so um, in terms of where to start and, and guides, uh, the old field guides used to be the common way to go. Is there any advantage to taking field guides with you versus uh, another kind of app that uh, may not give the detail? If somebody's starting out look, trying to identify? Yeah. we. There, there are some kind of smaller guides out there now, including Francis and Troy's Guide to Common Lichens in Nova Scotia. Um, a lot of the other books are pretty hefty. Uh, you can't take them anywhere. Uh, right. you know, Bro Brodo and um, what's the other one? Uh, Heinz, uh, Macro Lichens of, of New England. You know, they're, they're kind of big bulky things. Um, so uh, if, if you can find uh, somebody else who's a lichen enthusiast mentoring is is you know a good way as well especially in Nova Scotia where there's good opportunity for that um, and, and learning from others is 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 a good way to go because it is pretty complex <laughs> mm. oh my and, goodness and we do from time to time host courses over the years too we've we've had some kind of courses and and I know there's also some curriculum kind of being developed uh, with St. Mary's uh, and lichens and s and things like that so there might be some opportunities for that in the future too excellent i'm sure a lot of people like me now have a better understanding about the lichens being a positive thing that it's not robbing <laughs> from that tree it's not harming the tree an indicator of you know air quality and and nitrogen fixing all those things that most of us would not have known before there's so many things that, that you were able to talk about which is great we have some questions here including if old man's beard is a lichen, why does it seem that trees with it often seem to be dying? Also, do you find ticks, especially in the leafy lichens? Hmm. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I haven't seen ticks. Um, but yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. I would wonder if other people have. Uh, I, I wouldn't doubt it, but you know, <laughs> they're all over the place, it seems. Um, and the, I, I'd say the, um, if you, for the, the old man's beard, if you get up in the canopy of a live tree, you'll find that it's there. But, but when trees are dying, or especially uh, when often people, where people notice it is tamaracks in the winter. Um, so it looks like it's on dead trees, but it's actually just tamaracks that have lost their needles for the winter. Um, uh, but often, yeah, when trees do die, they can still live on them because it's just a surface for them. So if you have a stand of trees, of spruce or something that dies off, it's it can still live there because it just needs a place to hang. Yeah. I know what they mean too. I have several trees that are dead on my woodlot, but yet it's just full of old man's beard. Normally you wouldn't see it, I guess, when the foliage is there. Yeah. And it, and, and, and it grows, it would get larger over time, I guess. Yeah, the especially once the needles yeah. are gone, it can just grow to its own content kind of thing yeah right on not, not no nothing's blocking or interfering uh greg asks when you look at the province as a whole what is the lichen moss and liverwort's health telling us about our forest conditions or health hmm. 
It's kind of yeah, that's an interesting question. It's highly dependent on <laughs> on on kind of where you are, yeah. Um, because you could, I can walk into a forest in Lunenburg County that's exactly as it should be, uh, but has really low lichen diversity. You know, it's it, it's a there's drier parts of this province that that are climax forests that that don't have very good diversity for lichens, mosses, and liverworts. So, um, I guess, yeah, it's so <laughs> in in general, liverworts and mosses are, are even less, we know even less than, than lichens, so we don't really have any of those with a conservation status in terms of being endangered or threatened or anything because we're still learning what we even have for those. Um, but I guess in terms of, of lichens, the the kind of, it's getting harder and harder to find some of these lichens and you're going deeper and deeper into the woods. Uh, Wolfgang Mass in the 70s and 80s was able to find boreal felt lichen on the side of the road uh, and growing on, it grew on branches, it grew on species it doesn't grow on anymore. It's It's retreated into a kind of niche of the very best habitat and it's and it's not growing in marginal areas anymore so it's that's telling us that something's happening in the greater ecosystem that's that's not allowing it to thrive in the kind of wider system anymore so they i guess that's it can tell us things like that okay we have a, a couple of questions here uh, gloria and, and jolene are wondering about good id guides printed guides is there any other thing that you wanted to add to that or do you think you've done that <laughs> <laughs> I guess, yeah. Yeah, I, I really, there could be more out there now. I, I kind of have what I have, which is the kind of main ones, the yeah. uh, okay. Proto and Heinz and Francis and Troy's. And... <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for that. Is there a time of year that is best for lichen identification and photography? Uh, we kind of do a lot of our work in the in the fall because one, especially once the leaves uh, fall off of the undergrowth vegetation um, it gives us a much better line of sight for finding things if you don't have all the shrubs in the in the lower part of the forest if they don't have their leaves on um, uh, that's definitely for us I don't know about photography wise or anything but but I guess you know if you go out when it's foggy uh, or, or kind of just after a rain, that's when lichens kind of look their best because they can go into kind of a hibernative mode uh, and, you know, get really crusty when they're dry. And then when they're wet, they open right up and they kind of look their best. So that's kind of, for photography, that's the best kind of time to see them. But, yeah. So similarly, does that mean winter would not be the best time? Um, no, because uh, they can quite often look pretty good if there's been snow melting on the tree and they've gotten some moisture and it's you know kind of warm enough that they're they're opened up and and you know have some moisture on them uh we def we don't we there's no time of year where we can't survey for them unless the trees have snow on the surface of the trunk that's blocking us from seeing it which happens after windy snowstorms sometimes sure. here's a cool question um can you take a sample and how would you save it for a specialist to look at and identify after the fact hmm yeah so um yes collecting is is definitely a way to really get an expert to confirm something um if it if it's something you think is rare, it comes with the risk that you could be removing something that's rare. Um, and um, you know, like we 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 don't do collections for our most rare species, um, and it, it were, would require a permit to do so. Um, but uh, definitely, you know, collections uh, are still a way that we're. Um, figuring out lichen species and, and putting them in museums and, you know, kind of that kind of stuff that's still happening for common, uh, lichen. So, yeah. And there's, there's lots of reading out there you can do on, on how to do it, the best ways for different kinds of lichens and the, how to make little envelopes and put all the information on them that, that somebody would need to make a determination. 
Okay, you gave some good examples of specific species that uh, that grow in specific species of trees. Um, and, and somebody, Richard was asking, can you explain why different species tend to grow on different species of trees, considering they don't absorb nutrients from the substrate? Yeah, that's that's one of those things that's probably uh, we don't know what we don't know <laughs> mm -hmm. um, part, but um, you know, it, people have their kind of suspicions about bark pH and um, things like that, but uh, it's kind of not something that's been really well studied with a lot of species. Um, and, and some of them that, that, you know, we we think are associated more with one species, you know, we find over time, oh, you know, uh, we found them on, on different species. Like recently, uh, Jonathan Riley looking in Digby County started finding blue felt lichen on species we didn't really think it grew on before. Um, because nobody in that area had ever really looked kind of thing. And so we kind of are still learning some of those things uh, um, that uh, they can be on more diverse things than, but yeah, we don't really know sometimes why they're on just one huh. species and not others really. Some people, maybe somebody does, but I don't. More research <laughs> required probably. Now here's a question that came to my mind as well, looking at your map to show how little work's been done in Northern part mm -hmm. of mainland. Um, are you looking for landowners to offer their land, to offer uh, surveying uh, for woodlots in, in areas that you haven't had a chance to do so yet? Yeah, that, that could be an exciting opportunity for sure. Um, because they're definitely uh, in some parts of the province, there's not much crown land compared to others. Uh, um, so, you know, crown land's kind of the easiest uh, place to kind of go and, and do uh, work. Uh, but if, if people do have private uh, woodlots that they're interested in, in having a look at, you know, there are kind of opportunities there. We have a, a funding program with Habitat Stewardship Program through Environment Canada um, that kind of gives us money for stewardship with uh, private woodlot owners and things like that. So there's there's definitely opportunities um, there for sure. And what would you suggest private landowners do if they are interested in making that connection? Yeah, they could probably just get in touch with, with me at, at NPRI and, and maybe we could figure it out from there. Excellent. Yeah. That's, that's a great contact. Thanks for that, Brad. I, we're running into a little bit of overtime, but that's okay. People are keen, so we'll like, we'll keep going for a little while longer. Uh, somebody's curious why not much is known about lichens in Cape Breton Highlands Park area, according to your map. Great session, they said, by the way. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so my map is of all the, the, the kind of tracks that I have, which is, you know, from our staff and, and a few other people who aren't our staff. Um, there's definitely, if, if my map showed collection dots, there'd definitely be some up in Cape Breton Highlands National Park. Um, so yeah, if I had plotted the ACCDC data of, of lichens, uh, there'd definitely be some in the park. Uh, there's been a fair bit of work done uh, there. Those tracks are just kind of reflective more of where our staff have been doing. Um, lichen surveys, so. I see, so there could be more yeah. by others. Yeah, there is in general in, in that side of Cape Breton Island, much less effort put in than the other side. Okay. You mentioned about the nitrogen fixing uh, aspect of, of many lichens. Um, is, does that, is that a reason for protecting them? I think, I think it's a, it's a reason to kind of um, manage a forest and woodlot in such a way that you retain you know, that retain a good diversity of them is, is, you know, so it contributes to your soil health, which then contributes to your tree health, you know, so. And, yeah. and here, here's one that goes back to benefits to people. Are there any mm -hmm. edible lichens in Nova Scotia or those used for medicinal purposes? Um, there are, uh, it's not something uh, I know uh, much about. There are people who do uh, know that, uh, I think, oh, I'm trying to remember. I saw somewhere, I, I can't remember, but I've definitely seen people who have, uh, talked about lichens, which ones are edible and things like that. I know that I was watching a, a f kind of foodie show about a Michelin star restaurant in, uh, it was Finland or somewhere. And they, they, they had lichens as a part of their dish, uh, just lightly poached kind of thing. 
<laughs> like, um, why? Why are we so lucky? Why is there such a high diversity of, of and, um, and volume of lichens in Nova Scotia? It's it's probably to do with um, so um, the the amount of rainfall, fog, um, you know, all those kind of conditions because lichens are getting those things from the air. Um, good air quality in general. Um, all those kind of things are probably creating those conditions as well as, you know, having good amounts of, of forest that are, so we have a, a lot of wetlands. Uh, and so a lot of those, a lot of wetlands with a lot of forests on the edges of wetlands. So those really high moisture conditions, uh, as well as the kind of moist climate around that is kind of combining to provide, uh, all those kind of ideal conditions for sand lichens. So a lot of lichenologists come here for that benefit, I guess, eh? Mm -hmm. That's why, that's yeah, why you have it's, such a large number. Um, there's stuff you can see here that you really can't see anywhere else in North America and, and, and easily. Like, you know, you can find some of them easily that people, it's super rare in other places. A form of ecotourism. Interesting. Um, <laughs> we have two people in a row here that were wondering about the mist slides. I think they like your slides and the information and the photos and are wondering if they'll be able to see it, see those missing slides in the recorded version of this. I forget if each one of your slides were shown briefly when you went through. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it depends how, how able they are to hit pause. I don't know. Yeah, Maybe they showed was... up enough. Okay, um, well. It was based, each one was basically each of the listed species and kind of uh, what kind of habitat they are in and, and what we kind of know about their threats. Okay. And we, that that was, if, if somebody was really interested in that, mm -hmm. yes. uh, they could email me and I can, I can send them those slides for sure. Excellent. Thanks for that. Or a copy of the presentation. Perfect. Somebody's wondering about the best time of year to look for lichens. Yeah. Uh, again, it's, it's, probably fall just in terms of having the best sight lines uh anytime where there even spring before before leaf out uh anytime where you can kind of see far in the forest because quite often you know a lot of trees there and, and something can catch your eye from far away but if you have vegetation in between you and it you're much less likely to uh to see that far away okay here's somebody that knows a little bit about uh about this the topic has plus Plastomedia glauca been collected and used for anything? It very well could. I, it's a yeah, skin that the uses of them, the practical uses is, is not my specialty. I know there's, there's definitely people out there who, who know that stuff. Okay. Um, another question is, are there species in particular we should be looking out for to indicate forest health? I think there were many species that you talked about. Yeah. So yeah, definitely uh a lot of the the kind of rarer ones which i showed in a list but not didn't really get into those are the one the slides i skipped all those rare ones are kind of really good indicators that you're in you know a really healthy forest that you're in um a, a forest that's you know had pretty continuous forest cover um or is in a climax state of some sort because we yeah we do have lichens that are in climax poplar stands in the valley and things like that so okay. um yeah, any of those ones can be good indicators of forest health. Excellent. Boy, we've never had this many questions, Brad. This is an <laughs> indicator right here. Um, if somebody wants you to come and do a course in Cape Breton, I'm sure there would be interest, they said. <laughs> um, Probably. Okay. I think what, we've what, done one in the past in Cape Breton. Well, yeah. obviously, there's a growing interest in this topic, so I think it would definitely be anywhere. Yeah, um, we're usually what, turning like, people away when we hold the courses, so. <laughs> Excellent. That's great. Uh, what lichens will deer eat? just about all the probably <laughs> well yeah i don't know uh i know yeah like uh caribou are definitely known for eating eating lichen um but i don't specifically know uh what what deer eat in terms of lichen yeah that's a tough yeah. one I don't if know. you have them if you have the lichen in communities like Truro, they'll definitely eat them because they eat everything else probably, yeah <laughs> okay yeah, they're probably so, often when they're browsing they'll probably take things in incidentally but I don't know if they really target any. Right. Okay, we're going to finish with two more questions because it's going to keep going. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, here's, this is uh, the two good ones, yeah. How long do the lichens in Nova Scotia typically live for, lifespan? Mm. 
so um we definitely have had trees like it host trees with the same species on them for uh you know well over a decade um in a few locations with boreal felt lichen um it's suspected to be a very long-lived species um but for other species we really don't have that that data um but it's yeah it's a really i guess it's really complex answer because sometimes they're they're they live as spores for a long time and waiting for the favorable conditions so it could be years being really tiny and then get favorable conditions and then just grow 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 and then be that size for a couple of years and then you know like it it can be really their life cycle can be really complex uh so it's really hard to kind of pin down how long they're really there but we know some of our boreal felt like in uh, have been continuously on the same host tree for, you know, quite a long time. So would it be safe to say you can't assume that even though you have some amount of lichen on a tree bowl, as the tree gets older, that it's not going to necessarily increase in amount and, and growth over that time? Or would it? Yeah, it, it might not. It it, okay. it, it it could fragment and become other, you know, different bits. Like it could grow and, and fragment and become different individuals or or it could reproduce and and pop up on other parts of the tree but die off on others you know uh but it would still kind of still be there on the host tree it might not necessarily be the same individual um so okay. it's yeah, age is kind of a hard thing with a with a thing like that <laughs> good question though carrie thanks for mm. that okay we get Nick's got the last one. This is it could be a little controversial, but also you can get some instructional information for landowners as far as protection. Do you think the current buffer zones to protect lichens at risk at risk is enough is sufficient? Right. So we have we have kind of three different buffers. We have a boro felt lichen which gets 200 meter protection and 500 meters special management between 200 and 300 or 200 and 500. Um, and uh, you know, I think that's adequate. We we used to have a hundred, and we kind of did some work and found out that wasn't really enough, uh, and got that increased to the two hundred with the five hundred, and and that's kind of we have good science to show that that's probably good, but we're still looking into that. We have a postdoc looking into that uh, level of protection now, and whether that's adequate. Um, and for the other species, we there's a 200 meter buffer on four species and then another list of species that get a 100 meter buffer. Um, and as far as we know from any of those species, those are adequate at this point, but we're just starting to get into survivorship monitoring for those species that have the buffers. Uh, so it'll be a few years of buffers being applied and then us going back and looking and seeing, you know, are they still there? Are they affected? Is their health increased, decreased, anything like that? So it'll be a few years before we'll be able to really assess whether those buffers are sufficient or not. But but based on the hardiness of some of those lichens, I think we're more confident that they'll do better with 100 meters than, say, Boro felt lichen did because it's really the most sensitive lichen species we have. Okay, and I guess to wind things up, on the lo along the line of protection, um, climate change, uh, it's coming, it's here. Um, are you expecting that that's going to be putting more stress, and more problems to lichen? Uh, yep. Yeah, we've had some discussions about this recently. I bet. It's, it's, you know, it's, um, there's, there's so many factors that are going to play into, uh, lichens with climate change because we'll have uh, tree species potentially changing their ranges so we're we're going to have host species that are that are changing their ranges and and how that'll affect the lichens will they be able to adapt and be on something else or will they have to move with them uh you know are we going to see ranges separate from each other and cause the one you know cause the lichens to go extinct you know we just don't don't know for some of that stuff and and you know kind of whether some of the predictions for increased 
rainfall and things like that in some areas of Nova Scotia might be more beneficial to lichens than, you know, and it's, it's really tough to, to there's so many factors that are, that are going to play in. Uh, there'll no doubt be impacts, but what they are and how they'll play out is really, you know, you're just kind of running these scenarios of it could be like this. And if it's like that, then that goes like that. And, you know, yeah. and all that is, is guesswork too, because we're still learning the fundamentals of these species <laughs> at this point. So, right. Yeah. Well, more, more to learn in the future. Absolutely. To never well, Brad, we better wind it up. Uh, sorry to take in overtime there, but obviously it was yeah, a no very worries. popular topic. You did a great job and we want to thank you very much. Uh, we have a lot of information there on Lycan for all of us participating today. And again, for those that watch this uh, in a future viewing uh, that, of a recording as well. So Brad, on behalf of the conference uh, organizing committee and all those participating today, I want to thank you very much for your time, effort and, and useful information. And obviously because of the fact we're not together here um, and only together virtually, we well, are unable to personally thank you for your time and effort, but we can assure you that we'll be providing you with a nice thank you gift in the coming uh, days and weeks. Uh, awesome. uh, and it'll, be, it'll be a a popular non-timber forest product, a favorite sweet <laughs> treat, a little maple syrup from uh, Rosebriar Farm of Carroll's Corner. So we'll track you down and get that to you. So thanks very Excellent. much. Awesome. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Okay, folks, so we have a couple uh, polling questions to, to give to you on your way out. Uh, the questions are, would you feel comfortable attending an in-person conference in April? Because that's what we're uh, intending and hoping to be able to do. And we want to get some feedback. Uh, how many are willing to, to come and, uh, and what your, what your uh, responses will be? Uh, number two question is, would you like us to keep offering online events in the future, such as in the fall? Or would you prefer to only attend in-person events? So do you want us to keep going with these virtual events? or just go back to the original uh, in-person conference format. Number three, what time of day do you prefer these webinars? Lunch hour from 12 to one, say through the week, or evening like we have been doing for the last uh, several months, or neither. <laughs> so while you're answering those, I also want to mention something Brad made me think of fungi. Fungi is a whole cool world too that m most of us don't know a lot about. And I saw a really cool show lately uh, on Nature of Things on CBC, How Fungi Made Our World. And it's really worthwhile seeing incredible um, um, camera work and, uh, and uh, just amazing information. So I just want to let you know with that. Uh, that brings to an end uh, to today's session. Our next Woodland Conference mini series webinar is March 9th. It'll be another interesting one. It'll be full. Well, uh, we have three topics that will be uh, including Mi'kmaq Forestry Initiative, Nechikalimp in Forestry, Mi'kmaq Traditional Use of the Land, and Mi'kmaq Forestry and Archaeology. So that is March 9th before March break week. Then after that, if, if uh, as I mentioned earlier, if the COVID protocols allow, we will be planning to offer our regular annual in-person full day conferences, including April 2nd in Millbrook, as I mentioned earlier, April 23rd in the 40s, and April 30th in Port Hawkesbury. The full conference webinar mini series schedule can be found on the nswoods.ca website. Again, we'd like to thank Brad for making this event meaningful for all those who, t who turned in today and those who will be viewing the recorded version at a later time. I also want to put a plug in here for Woya Woodland Owner of the Year Award. If, uh, if you or anybody you know you think is uh, deserving of recognition for being an outstanding woodlot owner, we would love to hear from you at any of our offices across the province at, at Natural Resources and Renewables. And finally, anybody if anybody knows of a potential Boston tree, uh, looking for trees that are 40 feet and above, spruce, fir, um, if it looks like it has potential, we'd love to hear from you on that too. Uh, finally, please provide your feedback about this uh, conference and this, this webinar tonight in your exit survey. This will help us plan for future conference events. To do this, before you close down your browser, click on Leave Event to get to the exit survey, and it only takes one to two minutes to complete. Your information will be kept private and not used for any promotional or commercial purposes, we promise. And if for some reason you're not able to complete the exit survey, just go to the nswoods.ca website and em just email the request to us that you'd like to get that survey and we'll send it to you by email. Okay, 
Well, that is finally it now, and uh, we hope that this was a worthwhile use of your time and that you learned lots. We look forward to our next session and hope to connect with you then. Thanks, and take good care of each other. Bye for now.